as you know, CEU is proud of its uh, central interest in human rights. It's certainly my own central interest, but it's, at, it's also at the heart of our university and so many parts of the university, whether it's in the legal studies department or sociology or gender studies or any number of other areas uh, where human rights um, is very much a core element of the, of the curriculum. And uh, human rights are under a considerable stress in the world, as I'm sure no one needs to be told. Um, there certainly, uh, certainly our lecturer doesn't need to be told because he knows this extremely well. Uh, stress here in Central Europe and Hungary and uh, elsewhere in Europe and the United States, more advanced democracies are finding that some of the institutions to protect human rights and democracy are under significant stress. So this is the th thematic background, I think, to the lecture that we're going to have here tonight. And I'm really pleased to be able to uh, welcome back to CEU uh, someone I've admired for many, many years. And uh, I think of him as my my favorite Nobel laureate, and I'll tell you why in a minute, both why he's my favorite and why he's a Nobel laureate. Um, but Thomas Hammerberg um, has spent really his whole career in, at the forefront of the struggle for human rights. Um, I first uh, knew him not well, but from a distance uh, in the, our days when we were together in Amnesty International, which is how he actually got the Nobel Prize uh, for peace on behalf of Amnesty International in 1977. Um, and I was at that point a human rights lawyer uh, in the United States and was active in Amnesty International. And Thomas was really our leader at that time and remains in many respects our leader today. Um, he has been really at the forefront not only of the general struggle for human rights, but the effort to bring into the human rights struggle the marginalized elements of society, um, which sometimes in the early days were not included in the human rights struggle so much, uh, whether that be in the field of Roma rights or the rights of uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender groups, uh, refugee rights, and of course the subject that he will be talking about tonight, disability rights. Um, these are extremely important because those who become uh, marginalized by society are by no means marginal members of society. They are at the center of society and no society can claim that it defends human rights and supports democracy if it does not uh, eliminate the concept of marginalization and, in fact, centralize the opportunities that all members of a society should have. So this is really the theme, and I'm not going to really say anything more by way of introduction except to, at this point, uh, turn over to uh, Oliver Lewis, who is a longtime visiting professor in our legal studies department and the director of the Mental Disability Advocacy Center, who will tell you more about the framework of tonight's lecture um, and then lead up to the lecture itself. So Oliver, please. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for coming. And on behalf of the Mental Disability Advocacy Center, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our first annual distinguished lecture at the Central European University. Uh, so warm welcome to current uh, students. We had our first class today. And uh, former students um, and colleagues in Budapest. Um, and for those who couldn't make it to Budapest, um, I know that there will be a lot of people watching this um, lecture online uh, in the days uh, and months, maybe years to come. Um, I will say a few words about MDAC, this annual lecture series, why it's at the Central European University, and why Thomas Hammerberg is delivering it. Um, then I'll hand over to Professor Renata Uitz, um, who will tell you who Hammer Professor Hammerberg is. Um, and there might be time then for, uh, Thomas, your lecture to uh, be delivered, uh, but we'll see. Um, there better be. MDAC was established 10 years ago by the Open Society Foundations. 
Um, and uh, it was really meant to be a, a regional, uh, hard-hitting advocacy organization to make the personal, for example, a naked woman in a cage bed in a social care home uh, in a Central Eastern European country into the political uh, and into the legal and into um, the framework of human rights. Um, we exist essentially to be a provocation, to use the law to create progressive jurisprudence, that's taking court cases to advance people's rights um, and to initiate law reform uh, and to empower people with disabilities, so victims of human rights, to participate in these pursuits. Uh, Central European University is one of the very few universities still in the world to offer a course on the rights of people with disabilities and the rights of people with psychosocial disabilities and intellectual disabilities in particular. Um, and that's surprising uh, because there are desperately few activists in this field considering the scale, which we'll hear about, the, the hidden nature, the intractable access to justice barriers and the sheer complexities of the human rights issues which face uh, people with disabilities. And I've been involved in teaching um, a course here at CEU for, uh, I think this is the 10th year. Um, and I'm really proud of the small army of energized lawyers um, that have taken the course. Many of them have uh, been funded by the Open Society Foundations through the uh, Justice Initiative Fellows. Uh, many have not. And I remember in my first class, um, there was a, a young student called Konstantin Kojikariu. Uh, he is now a very talented litigator working at Interrights in London and is the uh, attorney in the case of uh, the Centre for Legal Resources on behalf of um, a deceased person, Campianu versus Romania. Uh, and this case is pending before the European Court of Human Rights and involves a very sad uh, series of facts. Um, uh, Mr. Campa Campianu uh, was a man with intellectual disabilities and HIV who was shuffled around from institution to institution by the Romanian government and essentially died of absolute neglect. Um, and this case is challenging uh, the victimhood status at the European Court of Human Rights and is a really key test case. And actually, um, Thomas Hammerberg, as Commissioner for Human Rights, um, intervened in this case. And this is the very first case that the Office of the Commissioner has intervened in following the, uh, um, coming, the entry into force of Protocol 14 to the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, so there are lots of students who are uh, not only litigating disability cases within their portfolio of other uh, human rights cases, but also many former students of CEU who are working in the courts registry. That's a good way to um, uh, hopefully ensure some positive judgments. And I'm sure that um, it won't be too long uh, before we'll see a lot of European court judges who are CEU graduates as well. Um, MDAC has um, built its collaboration with CEU in, in several ways. Uh, from 2010, we've run a two-week summer school here at CEU focusing on uh, uh, litigation. Um, and from this year, we've run a um, clinical legal program with the Legal Studies Department. And I just want to thank uh, Professors Renata Uitz and Karoy Bard uh, and Michael Hamilton and, of course, Judge Andras Shayo for, for all your support over the years uh, to solidify that collaboration. So why an annual distinguished lecture? Well, it's our 10th year. Um, so it's somewhat of a celebration. Um, and we designed the series of lectures really to be a platform uh, here at CEU for leading human rights defenders to speak about any aspect of MDAC's uh, mandate. And these are not supposed to be dry, scholastic lectures where people nod off, uh, but they're intended to be thought-provoking um, and bring lots of examples from the field. And I'm sure um, Thomas Hammerberg's uh, address will, will fit into that. Um, so. As commissioner, and uh, Renata will tell you more about this, um, Thomas Hammerberg led from the front, uh, as the rector said, and often was way ahead of what's happening uh, at the kind of political discourse in uh, the various member states of the Council of Europe um, and within other human rights communities. Uh, his work illumina illuminated uh, hidden issues, literally hidden people, and he never shied away from taking controversial and uncomfortable issues and coming out with positions on that. Uh, his office was chronically understaffed. 
Um, yet he always managed to allocate some time of some of the staff uh, personnel to focus on disability issues amongst uh, other issues that they had to focus on. And I just want to here um, formally thank, the collab thank some people who we've collaborated with over the years, namely uh, Anna Nielsen, Dennis van der Ver, and Hassan Bermek um, from the Commissioner's Office for the wonderful work that they and colleagues um, have done. Uh, on, on behalf of the Commissioner. And it's really a credit to Thomas Hammerberg that uh, his successor, um, Niels Mujenix from uh, Latvia, has said right from the outset that he will continue to focus on the rights of people with disabilities uh, during his mandate, which began uh, in April and lasts for uh, six years. Um, Commissioner Hammerberg produced groundbreaking work on a number of different areas, as has been mentioned. Um, but what I found particularly interesting um, is that he was always very careful when visiting all 47 member states of the Council of Europe to firstly meet uh, NGOs, the civil society sector, and victims of human rights, to hear their stories before meeting anyone else, before meeting the national human rights institutions, and before meeting a government. And I think that act of listening uh, to the people first is, is a very um, empowering act. Uh, disability also um, was a key issue throughout Commissioner Hammerberg's mandate, and we will hear more about that. Um, MDAC extended an offer uh, to Thomas Hammerberg to become our honorary president. Um, and uh, the honorary president role will fortify our work in advancing the rights of people with psychosocial disabilities and intellectual disabilities. And I was really delighted um, that you accepted. And I'm humbled and thrilled in equal measure uh, to have the opportunity to learn from you. Um, and work with you over the coming years, and to listen to you as you deliver our first annual Distinguished Lecture this evening. Thank you. Thank you, President Chetak. Thank you, Oliver. And let me welcome everyone on behalf of CU Legal Studies. Um, it's not a very comfortable task to introduce someone after it was already <laughs> revealed that he is a noble Laureate, and a person who most of you in the room actually know as the second commissioner for human rights of the Council of Europe. So I promise I will be very brief, but actually this is one of the very few CVs in the human, human rights world where most of us would be proud to have held one of the many positions which Commissioner Hammerberg held over the years. Because in addition to being secretary general for, for Amnesty, um, he has also had been uh, Secretary General for Save, Save the Children, Sweden. Uh, he had a number of governmental appointments, probably the most senior and most prominent among these uh, was the one when he was Swedish Ambassador for Humanitarian Affairs. And in addition to that come a long list of international missions uh, which took him apart from the 47 member states to the Council of Europe, to Central Asia, Cambodia and the Middle East. Um, this is truly a life which probably if five or seven people had lived thus far, they should have been proud, every one of them. And uh, it was already mentioned that at the forefront of, of his mission, the marginalized were uh, the most important, or as Oliver said, the uncomfortable issues were, were the ones which he focused on. This is really striking about a career. I, I put down less stellar problems of human rights, so you could see that all the three people who came up to speak, to introduce the lecture, noticed uh, this about his topical issues. And let me add one more thing. Um, as a Personal impression, I, I have had the good chance of, of actually see the commissioner to interact with victims and, and human rights advocates and, and governments. And what was the most particular feature of, of these meetings is that he put issues of people who were clearly left behind by the political process back to a broader public discourse, way beyond the small circles of, of the human rights elite. And I think that many, many children, refugees, minorities, Roma people, LGBT persons, and people living with disabilities have a lot to thank him for. So let me invite you to finally deliver the lecture after all the laudation.
Thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the rector, whom I'm glad to see again. And thank you to Renate and to Oliver for your kind words. You did exaggerate, but I don't want to take time to correct the, <laughs> the sort of two kind presentations that you made. Um, have you read uh, Stieg Larsson, the Swedish writer? No. If you have, or if you're planning to do, you will recognize Lisbeth Salander, Lisbeth Salander, who is a key person in all three books that he managed to, to write before his unfortunate death. Lisbeth was deprived of her legal capacity. And the reason was that she had family problems among her parents. Uh, the father ill-treated her mother repeatedly and really badly. And in the end, she couldn't take it any longer. She attacked her father. But the father was in touch with the Swedish security. And he was a protected person. He was an important source for the Swedish security. And they arranged that this uh, somewhat violent young girl should be put away. And what they did was that they took her to a closed institution and gave her treatment there, tough treatment. She got electric shocks. She was tied to a bed for longer periods with this kind of, of uh, restraints that they had in the institutions at that time. But she survived this. And she, after some years, she was released but she was under surveillance by the security forces. And she continued to be deprived of her legal capacity. And it meant that she could not take any crucial decision about her life. Even when she wanted to go to a cinema or shopping, she had to ask the guardian that, she had been, uh, that they had decided to appoint to watch her uh, for the money that she needed. She was fortunate in the beginning to have a friendly guardian, uh, but um, when she began to be too obstinate and to be troublesome for the security agency, they swapped and they put another person as her guardian and she uh, uh, suffered um, abuse by this man, very severe abuse. And he demanded in response to give her the pocket money or the money for food and clothes, etc., sexual services. And in the end, he, uh, as you know, who read the book or saw the film, he uh, performed an extremely ugly rape of her tied up in a bed. Uh, and uh, she had a situation where she could not go to the court because she had no legal capacity. She was no one in relation to the authorities. Um, and therefore, she was prevented from raising her own issue in that extremely bad situation. And then, of course, she took revenge. And I recommend you <laughs> to go through, if you haven't read the book, because it's an interesting description of a very able person who was dis declared disabled, deprived of her identity and legal capacity, and, and suffered uh, uh, abuse by someone who used the power he had uh, against her. Unfortunately, this situation is not unique. It is not unique for Sweden. It is not unique today, even, in the European countries. We have a, a great number of people who are deprived of their legal capacity. And it means a lot for them. It means that they are deprived actually to be a person with human rights and rights. And of course, one aspect that is there in almost all cases is that they are deprived of their own money. Financial transactions are, are blocked for them in, in a, a great number of cases. They are deprived of the basic right to decide where to live and with whom to live. And they are deprived of the possibility to complain, to appeal against this situation, because they are non-person according to the, to the law. We have a, a great number of people 
in this situation in Europe, hundreds of thousands. And we have a situation in this very country where according to the statistics that we have, no less than 67,000 people are deprived of their legal capacity. Some of them totally, some of them partly, plenary or, or partly uh, deprived of their legal capacity. And this is one of the issues that I believe that needs to be discussed in some depths and uh, taken up as a major, major concern. There is a, a new trend for the moment when it comes to uh, the rights of people with disabilities, and in particular people with intellectual disabilities or psychosocial disabilities. We have a, a very interesting international convention being adopted um, not many years ago and now also in force, ratified by uh, a number of European countries, including this country, uh, which has a totally different approach to how people with intellectual psychosocial disabilities should be met in, in our <coughs> societies. The problem is that this uh, convention isn't really implemented fully in most of the countries. And I think the problem is that it, it's not a, a question of some changes in the law, it's a, a question of a totally different approach to uh, people with intellectual or psychosocial disabilities, a totally different approach. And instead of depriving people with these problems of their legal capacity, reducing their identity to a non-person in reality, the idea is that they would retain their legal capacity, but when needed, they would have the right to have support when it comes to decision making. And that's a, a, a very different approach, of course, and, and uh, important. The challenge, of course, is how this support can be designed in order to be meaningful and not again cause the kind of problems that many of those who are today deprived of their legal capacity have. And there are some interesting experiences there. One is actually from the same country as uh, where uh, Lisbeth Salander lived, or was supposed to live, uh, Sweden, where there is now a system of uh, uh, people with these disabilities would have the right to have a personal ombudsman or, or a, a person, it's difficult to translate the word, ledsagare in, in Swedish. It means uh, someone who would uh, be uh, present, who would be given guidance, but not take over the decision making. And perhaps the best uh, uh, translation is personal ombudsman. And, and this system has been introduced uh, and it works well, extremely well in, in reality. And the main point is that these people will not take over, will not take over the real decision making, but will be there to service uh, and to listen to the needs of the individual who has this uh, possibility. And the other uh, interesting uh, um, case where this idea about a change when it comes to uh, legal capacity has developed is in British Columbia uh, in, in Canada, where they have a system where people could describe in advance of problems what kind of help and assistance they would like to have in situations where they may need assistance for decision making. And the idea is that this will also go to one of the critical issues here, namely the right to vote, the right to take part in the political process. And many people will feel that people with uh, intellectual and psychosocial disabilities cannot have the right to vote. How could they, how could they judge uh, what is the right political line to take, what party to, to support, etc.? But it is possible, it is possible but there is a need for the possibility to discuss, ask questions, and get uh, um, answers which are reliable and positive. And that is a challenge, of course, in the way the system of a system is, is developed. So this is one of the major challenges now when it comes to how we change our policy, our approach to people with uh, intellectual and psychosocial disabilities. The other point where I think there is a need for 
rethink and rather radical rethink relates to the institutions that we have. We still have major institutions, large dysfunctional institutions where people with intellectual and um, psychosocial disabilities are placed. And I know from my travels that the situation in those institutions, I've been in many of them, are, are, are appalling, are really bad in many places. They are not only big and sort of factory-like, but they also the conditions inside are bad. Uh, there are very little activities going on, and people just sit there in the corridors. Many of them are, are medicated much more than they need, and, and actually drugged, and uh, because people would, uh, the staff would like to prevent them from having outbursts or angry or show, show feelings, they are dragged. Um, the uh, uh, staff there usually badly paid. Many of them are not educated and, and really are not suitable to deal with uh, people with disabilities. Often these uh, uh, institutions are placed far away from population centers in the deep countryside. The idea may have been that they should enjoy the, the, the nature and feel comfortable with being out there in the forest or in the, in the, in the nice uh, uh, surroundings. But in reality, they're isolated from the rest of the society. Uh, and there is a need to start more seriously than so far the process of deinstitutionalization. The idea is, of course, around since uh, several years by now. But uh, the, the, the process of deinstitutionalization goes slowly, and it's not well <coughs> done. And it's not well done. We have still uh, institutions where children are placed, children with disabilities, often combined with children uh, who are orphans or come from socially dysfunctional families. Uh, they have uh, not any physical or, or mental disabilities, but are still um, in, in problems. And they're all put together. And uh, the situation in those institutions tend not to be, not to be good. But it's not only a question of, of closing those institutions, it's a, a question how this is done. It probably has to be done gradually uh, over time so that people are not just kicked out of these institutions and, and left uh, in, in those situations. One has to recognize that quite a number of those who are in the institutions have been institutionalized, gotten dependent on the situation in those institutions, and that has to be taken into account. What we want is that the principle of independent living in the community is accepted. And that should be the guidance for policy making in this area. This means that we would like, if people cannot move back to their families, which often is the ideal situation and may require some support to the family in order to cope with the fact that one or two members of the family it has um, problems of this kind. Uh, but I think when it comes to children in the institutions, this should be the first option to consider to go back to the family and get support through the family to have the, the um, adults being able to cope and relate to and love uh, the child in that situation. But uh, in many other cases, uh, the family option isn't there. And then there is a need of finding a solution which makes it possible for these people to be a part of the community, to live not with hundreds of others, but with a few other people, and to have the services that are needed for them to be able to function in, in, the, in the societies. And, and, and that is the approach that one should take. And uh, I think it's very important that when we are closing the big, dysfunctional, old-style institutions, that we're not building new institutions, which also would not function well. And I've been informed that there is actually here in Hungary a discussion uh, in relation to possibilities of funding from the European Union to have uh, uh, another approach, which would mean that up to 50 people will be brought together in a new 
uh, a form of institution, probably more modern, probably with better material standards, but that again is, is not the solution to this. Don't use money now to big new institutions, even if they're more modern. Try a, a, a more mod, a modern, um, a progressive, rights-oriented approach and, and think about the need to make it possible for these people to live in the community, to relate to the rest of the community and get the support that may require in order to, uh, to function in, in that situation. So that's the, the other uh, very, very important uh, uh, issue, I think. And uh, I know that uh, the MDIC is, is stressing the importance of those two points. Don't deprive people of their legal capacity. Offer the uh, possibility of some support in decision making and develop a system which is right friendly for that. And secondly, phase out the old dysfunctional institutions and uh, secure that there is a, a good alternative for that. This in turn requires uh, a systematic policy by uh, the authorities. And I think one key point there is to accept that there is a need of monitoring. Uh, the people we're talking about are vulnerable. They are subject to uh, discrimination in our societies, even hate speech in some cases. Uh, there is a need of monitoring wherever they are in order to ensure that they are protected and that they have the right to exercise their human rights as everyone else. So monitoring is key. Another key aspect when it comes to shaping the new policy in regard to uh, people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities is to do it together with them, to consult, to listen to them. And they have themselves formulated this interesting slogan, uh, not for us, without us. Don't do the, 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 the changes, don't introduce a policy which is alien from us involve us. We know better our situation than you. And that's definitely true. There are very few politicians with concrete own uh, um, experiences in this field. They may have a relative and that helps them to, to take the right decisions. But go back to those who are really related to the, concretely to the, the situation, their families um, and their organizations. And too much of the decisions in this field have been taken on top of these people, not with them. And that's, that's uh, another part. Then, in order to make uh, this policy serious, I talk about uh, the uh, um, Convention for the Rights of People with Disabilities in the United Nations, when they should, this policy should be implemented. Uh, there is a need to have a, a, a systematic policy. It's not just a question of being nice now and then and take snap decisions. It's a question of building a policy, systematic policy, which means that you have to uh, review the legislation and, in all, and, uh, and ensure that the spirit of the United Nations Convention is actually reflected in the legislation itself. But the laws, of course, are not sufficient. You need also to secure that there are institutions which would ensure that the laws are implemented in reality and the spirit of the international standards. Which means that you have to have a focal point in the government. One ministry should be appointed to be key responsible. You need to ensure that there is um, a coordination within the authorities so that the different aspects will come together and there will be a holistic approach. One thing that is often missed is that we have different layers. Uh, it's not enough to have some coordination in the, in the government cabinet. It's very important to have a coordination between decisions on the local level and on the central level. And that's very often a missing link uh, when it comes to, to these matters. And there's a need of a plan, an action plan, which step by step would introduce this policy. And that is particularly important now in a period of economic crisis. If you don't have a plan, it's very easy just to cut out uh, the expenditures for precisely this group of people. I've noticed when traveling uh, 
during the last couple of years that some of the most victimized groups of people as a consequence of the budget cuts, the austerity budgets, are precisely this group of people. They, they suffer from the budget cuts and often they have not strong spokespersons who could defend their interests um, and some politicians may feel they're just too expensive and uh, reform work is stopped. And I think it's uh, a, a question of honesty and uh, courage to ensure that these groups of people are not being the key victims when it comes to the policies that we are now introduced in Europe. There is a need of money. The changes that we ask for are not for cheap. They will cost some money. But these are human beings and they have the right, they have the right to get the support they need and they have the right to live an independent uh, life in our societies, in our society. They belong, they're part of us. I think also, apart from a, a, a strict policy when it comes to ratification of the international standards, changing the laws, establishing the institutions that will work, establishing a, 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 a sort of a mechanism of consultation with the groups themselves, including their spokespersons within the uh, uh, non-governmental society, uh, and the consultation with them themselves. Apart from that, there is a, a, a need to look at the basic attitudes behind how we have thought about this uh, for years, and, and not only believe that we change by changing the law and establish institutions, it goes deeper than that. And the attitudes are not there in many cases. Uh, there is a need to make people with disabilities visible in our societies. One consequence of the policy of putting these institutions far away was, and perhaps that was a purpose, to make them invisible. They disappeared from the scene. We didn't have to see them or confront them and be with them. And that has to be broken. And they must be uh, visible in our societies. And there's a need to change there. I think this is also a question of language. Um, some years ago, uh, we didn't say rights of people with disabilities, we say handicapped people. We felt that after a while that was a bit stigmatizing, so we began to talk about disabled people. In Sweden now, uh, we don't talk about disabled people, we talk about people with hmm, functional barriers. Uh, it's difficult to translate. But the idea is to make clear that we are not talking about that something is wrong with the person. We're talking about the problem that the society doesn't give space for the individual to, to, to exercise his or her rights. So the problem is that the society has not adapted to the needs of the individual. And that's a, a, a very important shift in thinking and uh, should also be reflected in the, in the language itself. I think also there is a, a problem, I mean, talking about language, do you know that in, in some countries in Europe, the term for people with disability is invalid? In Russian, for instance, is, uh, is invalid. What does it mean? Not valid. And, and this, if, if, if a language could be stigmatizing, it's that. Uh, and there is a need to, to help the rethink through also look at our own use of, of words and, and language. Uh, and that's, that's in, in my opinion, critical. Then, when it comes to attitudes, what we do, even with the term disabled, is that we, we tend to divide humanity into two groups, able people and disabled people. And that's, that's not right, because we are all, we are all partly disabled in different stages in our life, uh, as a small child, of course, but also when we grow old, we, we lose some of the, the capabilities we had before. We get, in that sense, disabled. And we have all our characteristics. So, in fact, we are all involved in this somehow, and there are different grades and different uh, aspects of this. But this uh, brutal uh, division in two, mm -hmm. two categories of people, abled and disabled, isn't right. And unfortunately, even the, the word disabled, which we use here, 
is not really appropriate in the sense that it tends to perpetuate this idea about two groups of people. We all belong to the humanity. We have all problems sometimes uh, uh, during different stages of our lives, sometimes uh, all the time. And, and again, there is a, a need to rethink. So though we have focused much on uh, standard setting, uh, talking about institutions, monitoring, etc. For me, it goes back to attitudes, attitudes. And what we want to have now is to move from um, a, a thinking about charity to be nice to people with, with problems uh, to rights. They have rights. And that's why it's so crucial that we have now a convention talking about the rights of people with disabilities, which makes clear also that all should have the legal capacity. Don't deprive anyone of legal capacity. Give support in consultation with the individual that the institutions are not the right solution to people with problems. There must be better alternatives than that, etc. So the rights are formulated now, and we have to accept that language and, 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 and that approach. It's a question of solidarity. And I think we really are talking here about a paradigm shift from a paternalistic approach to really empower everyone. Thank you very much. This was really powerful and essentially to, to hear about Lisbeth Salander um, is a very strong start, partly because Larson himself narrates the novel as a gender novel. He doesn't narrate it as a disability novel, so uh, which is, I think, putting a different perspective and you may wonder why is it that he made the character stronger with making her to lose legal capacity. So apparently there are multiple stories which you want to reflect on. Um, I was told to encourage the audience to ask questions not only about disability issues, but about any human rights issue, uh, which Commissioner Hammerberg's broad expertise encompasses. So let me see the hands on the floor. And there are two microphones. Uh, Peter is first, but if you put your hands up, then I will be able to direct the microphones to you. Thank you for the very nice presentation. And I, I very much, I am Peter Molnar from the, from the Center for Media and Communication Studies here at CU. And I very much agree with your point that it's mostly about attitudes and changing attitudes. And uh, vocabularies as well. In Hungary, for example, even in liberal discourse, often Roma people mentioned like Roma parents and Hungarian parents are doing this or that. And people don't even notice that they exclude Roma people from the community of Hungarians that way. So it's huge, it's a huge issue and I wonder that what do you think in what ways we can change those attitudes. So how can we rely on education? I believe also uh, getting artists, writers and other artists involved is key. How can they get involved <laughs> as art is not an instrument? I believe they can still do a lot by having an impact. So that's, that's my question. Hmm. That's, that's, that's really a, a major uh, issue, in fact. Uh, and we have a tendency today of uh, extremism uh, growing and spreading in many European countries. Uh, I think it's important to try to analyze why is this. Uh, and I'm not able to do any uh, competent analysis of this, but I believe that unemployment or the threat of unemployment is one factor, that people are scared. Uh, I think uh, at the same time uh, 
that's my, my sort of main point. I think the politicians have a lot of responsibility. And what I'm sad about is that I feel that the established politicians, the midstream politicians, those who are in the government, they very often do not take on the task to stand up and to explain uh, the values that the, our society is built on. Uh, European values, tolerance, respect for the others, um, and, um, and, and react against hate speech, which comes from, from some in society. So I think um, the role of the politicians there uh, is absolutely crucial. And I think we, we, we should point finger at the politicians and ask them to take more responsibility for creating an atmosphere. Then I think people are, are often influenced by um, role models, uh, not only politicians, but also them, but also people who appear in television, artists, um, film stars, uh, sportsmen who are popular, etc. The more of them who could stand up and be good examples and make good statements, the, the better it would be. Uh, then media, of course. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, so crucial to protect the freedom of the media and plurality of the media in our society so different voices can be heard. Um, um, and, and, and the media, of course, do, does still, uh, do still influence people. A, a, a new component has come into this, of course, with the social media, the new media, where people can communicate with quite large uh, circles uh, with similar opinions and um, opinions which are dangerous for our society. Uh, I think uh, quite a lot of lessons must be drawn from the tragedy in Oslo on sec 22nd of July last year. Uh, and this man, the, the murderer, uh, he had been in touch with quite a number of people with the same opinions and they have sort of supported one another and they have never heard the counter arguments and, and the other uh, sort of picture of, of life and relationship and, and the situation. So there, there are some dangers with um, misuse of the new media which we need to discuss. Uh, and finally education, the schools, and the universities as well that uh, uh, we, we should have the courage to discuss values in, in the schools uh, and sometimes I believe that teachers need some guidance on how to have uh, le lessons on values without uh, being seen as trying to brainwash uh, the kids and sort of instruct them how to think, that's communism. But at the same time allow for a discussion which enlightens the, the, the pupils and give them arguments to cope with uh, um, challenges in society later on. So I, I don't, there's no one solution, but I think we have to review all these channels of information. Yeah, yeah um, I'm Aeyong, as you already know. Um, I'm an alumnus from CEU, and currently I'm working with MDSE, and you're welcome on board. I just enjoyed listening to you, and I'm you know, the more you listen to someone, the more you know that person. That just listen, the more you listen to someone, just by listening to you, the more I tend to know you. Yeah, yeah it's unfortunate that we've not had this time to discuss this, this in this length in the office, but I'm, mm. I'm particularly interested in, in one thing. From um, all the introduction that they've given, it shows that you, you developed interest towards issues that has to do with... Um, these people that happens to find themselves in situations of vulnerability mm -hmm. or society has placed them in situation of vulnerability. Um, what I'm interested in knowing is what inspired you as an individual to develop interest towards these people because these are issues that have been there for long. I don't just want to think it's because um, you're the human rights commissioner or because of your experience in the field of human rights. I'm getting too personal, but I would like to know what really like, inspired you or triggered you to get this interest towards these people, because when I grow up, I would like to be like you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I often get a question, actually, from journalists uh, 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 whether I get uh, uh, sort of... Uh, when I see... Uh, bad situations in institutions of various kind, in prisons, etc., where I get um, 
sort of uh, tired of it or, or disillusioned and, and lose uh, energy. And uh, how could you just go on and go on and, and consume all these uh, impressions of, uh, of misery and uh, violations? But it works the other way. The, the more uh, you are in this field and the more people you meet and the more um, uh, descriptions of life you hear, uh, the more committed you, you, you become. Uh, because it, it underlines how, how absolutely fundamental this is. Uh, I also have drawn the conclusion that there, there are certain groups in society, if they are protected when it comes to human rights abuse, the situation is better in that country. Uh, there, there's almost like a litmus test. And uh, I, I don't, it doesn't operate like this in reality, but uh, in theory, one could think about trying to identify the most vulnerable in society and look at how they have their situation, how it is, uh, and, and, and then you could judge the rest of the society from that, uh, that uh, impression. Um, so I, I think uh, if, if the, we could deal with people with um, intellectual and uh, psychosocial disabilities in the way they deserve, in spirit of human rights, then with that would come a lot of improvement in the society as a whole, uh, because these are the vulnerable ones, and if we can understand how we relate to them, we could relate to the rest in society. So it's um, that. But uh, what have made me committed, I, I, I uh, when I was just very young, uh, in the teenage, uh, I, I learned uh, in depth about the situation in Europe during the Second World War and the Holocaust and uh, what happened to the Jewish population and to the Roma population. And, so. and that was for me the start to understand that justice is absolutely crucial in uh, human relations. And that's where it started. And then when I went into other uh, issues and traveled, uh, sort of it built on itself. So, yeah, I think you have a, a future in this work. <laughs> Thank you very much for the lecture. Okay. As you were talking about the practice of moving mental hospitals outside the, the visibility mm. area of the cities, placing them somewhere where we don't have to face them and cope with the existing problem, I was just remembering about the case I'm working on now regarding Roma people and the general practice of moving Roma people, the Patarut story near Cluj-Napoca in Romania, where the, the people were taken, 80 families were taken from the very center of the, of the city and moved into a completely remote area near a garbage, mm -hmm. um, how do you call it? Yeah, 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 where, where it's, it's ours, well, it's way too far from anything close to civilization and to, to, to the city. Mm -hmm. And we see that, you know, the explanation of the local authorities are quite basic, it's the only place that we have available, etc. But what's happening is that we, we have these communities of people taking outside the, the, the optic and the eye of the society, and we pretend that they are not there. We pretend that we, we don't have to, to deal with this any longer because it's not uh, in our face every day. But very practically, beyond enthusiasm, which is very inspiring, what can the Council of Europe and, and institutions very practically do to encourage member states and to encourage authorities to, 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 to you know, like to, to act in a way that would uh, make these people, you know, put the people, these people, like the Roma people and the people with, um, with disabilities, in the center of, of, the, of the attention. How can institutions like the Council of Europe uh, support member states or stop these kind of abuses before they happen, and whether these kind of institutions can actually have uh, a similar effect uh, uh, in, in countries like in situations like Romania and the Cluj-Napoca um, situation. Yeah. Mm. Another very fundamental question, in fact. Um, I, was, I was in Rome uh, one year and a half, two years ago. Uh, I went to the major uh, camp there where uh, Roma lived. Um, and uh, um, yeah, there were problems there, but they were happy to be there. I went to the mayor of, of Rome, and he had, I could see that here and there, put up posters where he gave the figures of the number of people he had expelled from Rome. 
uh, and it was a poster which was of course an updated uh, but, but he, he wanted to gain support by telling how much he expelled people um, from, from, from Rome. Uh, they, he decided that uh, the Roma in that uh, uh, camp I visited uh, should be moved away but he couldn't move them out of the country because uh, they had been there too long uh, and some of them came from the Balkans uh, and actually had actually been uh, some of them born in Italy and there were legal problems for him to expel them from Italy as a whole. So he decided that they would be moved some 40 kilometers or so outside, uh, further away. And the consequence of that move, he took it and they were pushed away, was that uh, the kids who were going in school, uh, uh, and they were in school, and, and the mothers I talked with, they were very keen that they should go to school because that was seen as a future for the family, that there was an education. Their main problem was how can we send our children to school clean because it was so muddy and when there was rain, etc. So the standard there was making it almost impossible for the mothers to, to put the children in a, in a shape that they would not be bullied by others in the school as, uh, you know, stinky, uh, dirty Roma. Uh, that was their main concern. But then, of course, they were uprooted uh, and uh, had problems uh, with the schooling. And, and nothing was gained out of this move. Uh, and, but it was a, a move that he took, obviously, to respond to a popular, uh, at least a perceived popular demand that the Roma shouldn't be seen. They were too present. In, in the in the society there, so that's one of many examples. I was in 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 Milano in uh, in June last year, uh, almost a year ago now, and there was a local election there. Uh, Berlusconi had his uh, there was a, a female mayor there in Berlusconi's party, and he got nervous because if they lost Milano, uh, that was a bad sign for him and for his party. Uh, so they got desperate, and they saw that the support wasn't there. So they put up posters all over, I was there and saw it, uh, put up posters all over Milano and said that if you vote for the opposition, uh, Milano will be a gypsy town. So they threatened with a sort of a takeover by Roma uh, in, in, in Milano if they didn't support the Berlusconi's party. Unfortunately, they lost that election, but it was a sign of a, a sort of political uh, reaction uh, appealing to the lowest uh, feelings among some of the people uh, and, and describing them as a threat against society. In fact, there were quite not so many Roma in, in Milano uh, and a fairly hidden uh, presence as well. But that, that's the kind of, of atmosphere we've had. Um, what can be done about it? Again, it's an attitude issue. Uh, I, I think that um, there is a need of a, a, at least a minimum of uh, opposition to this attitude that people must come out and tell that this is not right. Uh, Roma, again, uh, have too few spokespersons uh, among the rest of the population. Uh, and uh, uh, they, they are disadvantaged themselves in the in the public discourse. Uh, frankly, also among the Roma communities, there is such a disappointment and bitterness about their their role in society and how they have been treated. So they, they, why should we? They don't listen to us anyhow. Uh, and uh, there, there is a, a gap there between the Roma communities and the rest of the society, which is is quite wide nowadays, which um, um, tends to perpetuate this, this situation. To be concrete, uh, cases could be brought to the Strasbourg court in clear cases of discrimination. There have been some. Uh, perhaps the most important was in relation to education. Uh, it was a case in Czech Republic where they uh, put uh, automatically, in reality, uh, Roma children into classes for uh, people with learning problems. And that was um, uh, criticized. Still, there are problems there. Um, 
I think there is an attempt by the European Union and the Council of Europe to promote this idea about mediators, uh, preferably Roma themselves, who will be the link between health centers, health clinics, hospitals, etc., and the Roma population and, and sort of assist. The health standard, of course, is much lower among Roma than by others. And they tend not to go to the uh, uh, doctors uh, or nurses before they are really ill and coming late. So the preventive health uh, treatment is almost non-existent among the Roma communities. So that's one thing. Also mediators between the schools and the Roma families. Uh, and where it has been tried seriously, it has been a positive contribution. Uh, and there is a need of, of supporting this system. It has been done to some extent. But my own opinion is that the key is there to stop the anti-Roma uh, rhetorics and, and try to instruct the police and others uh, whom the Roma tend to meet more often to stop the, the, uh, the discrimination and to treat Roma as if they were human beings. Um, yeah. it's, the situation is not very promising when it comes to the Roma rights, unfortunately. I have Professor Fisher on the right. I'm, I'm Linda Fisher from the Department of Gender Studies. And I have three points I'd like to make. First of all, with respect to the vocabulary or semantics of disability. Um, the points you make are valid and the ways you express the, the language issues are true. But it's also the case, and I think important to mention, that within the disability community and disability studies, that the language issue is much more complicated. And in terms of vocabulary and how best to construe it, there is a certain amount of debate. For example, in North America, it's conventional to say people with, dis with disabilities. In terms of the people first idea. Whereas in the UK, for example, they hold to disabled people. And that's partly, partly to claim disability as an identity. as a valid identity that you don't want to attenuate. And so I think we also have to keep in mind that many people want to keep that part of their identity um, and lived experience. So just to make the point that these issues, along with these language issues, are more complicated. As well as being a debate between the so-called social model and medical model that you alluded to. My second point has to do with the various issues you were raising regarding deinstitutionalizing and reintegrating and independent living. Obviously, I understand that the emphasis in terms of today's paper framework. Was going to be on um, cognitive disabilities and psychosocial disabilities. But 
and also to make the point that independent or supported living. Also has to extend beyond that group of people with intellectual disabilities. And while they are in a way the most vulnerable among the vulnerable. And so perhaps have to be looked after especially. I think there's sometimes a tendency to somewhat overlook the needs of, of other disabilities. Or at least they don't always receive as much public attention. And so, for example, independent living or um, supported living can be equally important for people who are physically disabled, mm -hmm. Incapa physically incapacitated. And often their only recourse if they don't have family or, or caregiver support. Is precisely a institutions or a retirement home, perhaps living with people, uh, elderly people, thirty or forty years older than they. Or more. So I think we also have to think about that in this course problematizes and complicates the issues um, connected with the institutionalization and supported living. And my third point, finally. Is that in terms of the issues of attitudes, I was glad that you dealt into that um, that issue and, and not framing everything only in terms of rights. Because obviously rights and, and litigation and legislation are extremely important. But underneath that and perhaps motivating it or driving it is also the issue of societal attitudes. And I, and I think that is far more difficult to change than enacting a certain law or right. And in terms of, of how to do that, I would just suggest very briefly along the, ter the, uh, along the terms of dis visibility that you mentioned. That along with integration, which is extremely important, is also integration. No, inclusion. Inclusion, sorry. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about um, act, it's not just about accommodating and integration, but actively including mm -hmm. and meaningfully including. And so people are not just talked about and taken care of, but are actually included in a meaningful way. And that includes not only better representations in media and culture, but also be included as, as actors and agents.
Thank you. Uh, three very important points, in fact. If we believe that attitudes are ac absolutely crucial in this discussion, uh, this also means that we have to pay attention to the language. The language is so, so important when it comes to forming attitudes and to uh, almost indirectly influence our, our thinking. And I, I think it would be extremely valuable if one could have uh, some kind of academic work around the issue of language in this field and how language influences. And I still remember when um, I was a member of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child for a while, and um, we had a discussion about how to describe uh, children with disabilities. And uh, some people said, well, they're disabled children. But others said, no, they are children with disability. And uh, after a while, I think everyone understood that there is quite a difference between those two, uh, two expressions, which were, may not have been obvious for everyone at the very start of the discussion about this. Uh, but I, I think if one could do more work about, um, about the language, uh, when I raised the issue about invalid in, in Russia, and said, listen, uh, do you really understand uh, what, what creeps in uh, of attitudes when you use this term repeatedly? Uh, and they, 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 were, they didn't want to talk about it, really. They, they felt uh, I was raising something that was too difficult, or, or um, our intention is not to declare them invalid, but we have this word, and what shall we do? Yeah. Uh, and one has to go a bit further than that. Uh, what I said about uh, people with uh, intellectual and psychosocial disabilities, of course, in many respects also uh, apply to people with physical disabilities. Um, there is also there a need of uh, community living, support, and support which is uh, asked for and, and accepted by the individual, him or herself. Okay, on the left, I saw Max, I think. Um, Max Timofey from uh, Legal Studies Department. My question is, do you think that in terms of dealing with disability rights, human rights institutions uh, such as ombudsman institutions or human rights commissions are better placed than courts? And if you do think like that, uh, could you give reasons why? I don't think it's possible to answer that question generally. Uh, I think uh, the ombudsman approach could be uh, very useful in some cases. I think the uh, judicial approach, even to bring cases to the court in Strasbourg, may be the best effective uh, method in other cases. Uh, there, there are a couple of, of cases in Strasbourg, having then gone through the, the national judicial um, system, which have been crucial when it comes to the attitudes as well. And actually, uh, those I have in mind have actually been raised by the Mental Disability Advocacy Center here, and they have litigated. But there was one case uh, of a Russian called Stukatorov, who was, uh, he was in, in a closed institution. He wasn't informed, uh, he also was brought there, that he actually had been deprived of his legal capacity and his own mother had signed a paper that he should be taken to a, this closed institution and he was uh, informed afterwards he had no possibility again, like Lisbeth Salander, to, uh, to appeal against his decision until someone in his uh, vicinity uh, raised the case and finally came to Strasbourg and they said that he had been violated of his human rights and that decision uh, was quite crucial and was a good instrument to be used by non-governmental organizations and, and others to ascertain that that kind of treatment was not possible in the future. And there must be some possibility for the individual, him herself, to have an influence on these kinds of de major decisions. So it was a landmark decision. Um, there, there are a couple of other uh, similar decisions also. So um, the, the Strasbourg court, but also the national courts, could function as a, a sort of very decisive uh, pillar in the work if uh, the right cases are brought and it's well argued and the decision is the, the, the positive one. 
But in other cases where there is more a question of mediation and convincing, etc., perhaps the ombudsman offices could be more, more um, concrete and effective quicker. Uh, also because the judicial processes tend to be rather slow uh, by their very nature. So uh, it's, it's not either or. Uh, I think both instruments are, are needed. Uh, and of course, um, I would like to say that there are options to them as well, including the executive authorities really listening to the, uh, the, um, the, the organizations themselves, and the non-governmental organizations, uh, especially those who represent people with disabilities. Um, hi. Uh, I'm Andrea Quijan from the Center for Policy Studies, and uh, thank you for the very inspiring uh, talk that you gave. And my question relates to, to very present day things. And, and you are advocating, and, and I totally agree with you, and this is really nice uh, for a social transformation, for changing norms, attitudes, institutions, structures. And this costs a lot of money, I think. Yeah. And we are in this these times of crisis, and, and you mentioned this, and you are also, you also mentioned that we need a plan to, or we need a good plan to be able to address these issues. I mean, uh, budget items related to vulnerable groups, marginalized groups, are the first ones to be cut everywhere. And disabled people, women, uh, and we can list the groups that, that are the most vulnerable to these budget cuts. What's the plan we need? I don't, I, so do you have a, can you develop a little bit more on that? Mm. Yeah. Uh, that's probably a question that many, uh, many are asking nowadays and the politicians are giving certain priority, of course. Um, first of all, I, I'm not sure that uh, the reforms that are uh, required by implementing the United Nations Convention is so very costly. I think there is a risk to overstress the, the cost aspect. There will be some costs, but there will be costs anyhow. And I think when it comes to many social issues, it's probably better and more economic in the longer run to resolve the problem at an early stage rather than allowing uh, uh, the problems to, to grow and grow. Um, so uh, I think it, it's, it's, it's a question of, of uh, basic attitude when it comes to uh, what is costly <coughs> and not. But then I think uh, we have also to defend the expenditures when they are required for these reforms uh, with humorized arguments. We want a society where everyone has a right uh, and uh, we don't want a society where certain people are excluded, irrespective of the consequences when it comes to social cohesion, etc. We, we have agreed on certain standards when it comes to human rights, and it's important that we are loyal to these decisions uh, and that they are implemented. Otherwise, I think we begin to undermine something uh, important in society, the glue, the, the cohesion in the society. And I think we run the risk now in Europe to to have a divided society where certain people are seen as not really valuable, invalid in a sense. Um, and, and do we want that kind of society? And even if it costs a little bit more than it does today, uh, I think it's worth it. So we have to both, a two, two track, both to try to define uh, the real costs of the reforms needed, and I'm sure that there wouldn't be so incredibly much higher than the costs already for running these institutions. These institutions, for instance, are not cost-free, uh, quite, quite expensive actually. Um, uh, so to, to define the real cost there, but, but secondly, when there are expenditures, to have the courage to say that it's worth it, because we want that type of society. So then let's take the last question. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think I need a microphone and I'm very close <laughs> anyway. That, Thomas, thank you so much um, for your really extraordinary uh, lecture and your long time commitment to these issues. And, but you, you provoked me in this last statement uh, to ask you one last question, if I may. And that is, I think rights to be fully, to have a plan 
and to to have uh, ultimately some degree of a rights revolution that can be successful, one does need to enter into the world of politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, politics have been behind almost all of the successful rights revolutions. Um, you know, I, I come from a, a, an American tradition where obviously the civil rights movement um, was both political and judicial, and it was very much focused on, uh, on, on the realization of rights that were articulated in, in, in legal terms, but also very much in the political realm. So I ask you the question whether, indeed, in this field, there isn't uh, a need for politics. And I think there's even a precedent here. Um, and it's a precedent that, that has to do with the earlier disability rights revolution that took place uh, in Europe and in the United States and in some other countries as well, which actually had a very high cost. I mean, it was all the retrofitting and the various other elements that went along with that. And the means by which this political movement managed to be heard, I think, what you were alluding to it in some respects in your comment. Um, people with relatives and people who had engaged, who had, there was, this whole issue touched the society much more broadly than the society realized until people started organizing around it. So how can one politically organize around this issue to actually achieve, uh, as was asked, the plan that might actually implement uh, a good deal? I, I get it about the changing of attitudes, but in the end, Politicians are only going to really respond to political movements, I think. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've said today when <coughs> propagating for MDAC that it's, uh, it's good, competent, etc. And I've said non-political. But uh, I, I frankly don't believe that this is outside politics. Uh, uh, this issue is very much part of politics. And there is a need to, because if you take a, a sort of very pure approach that we work with things which are not at all political, we tend to create a distance between those who actually take the decisions and what we want to happen, and that doesn't work. So these are very political issues, and they have a cost aspects, and they have an attitude, uh, and it touches on ideology, frankly. Uh, I think human rights, in a sense, is an ideology, not the only one, and it could be combined with other ideologies, but it is an ideology in my opinion. So uh, I, I don't think we could shy away from seeing this as political uh, matters. Then what does it mean? Uh, first of all, I think we have to um, um, approach the politicians, those who are elected, uh, and try to convince them that we represent an interest in society, listen to us, and 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 hopefully also be in, uh, influenced by our, our arguments and uh, put that into the budget discussion but also other discussions including on, on lawmaking. Uh, secondly, how do we organize uh, uh, the, this interest outside? Uh, how do we build a pressure group? I think MDAC is one, one response to this uh, but there are other groups also. Um, MDAC is an international organization after all but we need also national uh, groups. Um, I, I'm quite influenced, of course, of my own country, Sweden, and the disability movement there, we call it like that, uh, has qu had quite a strong influence on, on politics, and uh, it became almost necessary for the political parties in order to get respect to have also uh, people from these communities on their lists. We had one minister who was blind, uh, we had others who, with disabilities in the, in the parliament, and it became a sort of um, recognition that it sort of represented the society as, as a whole. Uh, I think if one could create that kind of atmosphere, uh, it, it, it is positive. Um, it's, I, I think it's a, a question of trying to be present all over and to advocate. And there, uh, when I say non-political, I really meant party political neutral. 
uh, I think it would be a mistake to line up with the Socialist Party only or the Fidesz Party. Or, or I think there we should be open to have a discussion with everyone and not assume that because they are leftist or rightist, they don't understand and we give them up. That would be to party politicize our cause and that would probably undermine the effect and even the possibilities to to represent well those who are in need of, of um, uh, some changes in this field. That's basically my, my attitude. Uh, thank you very much for the reminder that, among other things, we do need courage. Yeah. And I would like to thank MDAC for bringing the lecture to CEU, and I'm hoping that we meet next year with an equally distinguished guest and audience and have so much in inspiration in the entire lecture series. It's a difficult thing to follow up on. Can I, yeah, I, I, one thing, I forgot to mention one thing. I was in Iceland, and you, you know Iceland had this tremendous economic disaster um, with the bank and the collapse, and the really like this uh, sank economically, and they had to cut the budget enormously. And what they did there was that they established what they called welfare watch, a special mechanism which didn't cost much because it was a consultation process where they in, include, they had some uh, politicians of course, some people working in the, not least the local authorities and some non-governmental people and representatives of the people. And this met now and then and they just checked whether the development was, um, did not affect the most vulnerable in society. That was a watch. And it was like a, a living organ which sent warning signals when the basic uh, needs of uh, uh, the people who were in need really uh, was affected. It was a very interesting approach and it had an impact. It did protect uh, uh, people. It was non-partisan, but it was political very much. Just as one example. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.